Debian signs round table. <laughs> um, so as an agenda, I put forth, I didn't get so much input from other people, but um, I put up some stuff which came up in the other talks, like data packages. Um, what I also think we might talk about is exposing the task packages on Debian.org more, as you mentioned in your talk. Um, Try and you yeah. Can your color. I think that's How's that going? Edit. Change it to white. Preference? No, it's not preferences, right? Ah, yeah. There's no one. What you can do is you reset to the color. Is that better? No. So the use of light color. Yeah. 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 What? Ah, oh. thanks for <laughs> thanks for the technical support. Perfect. So, um, yeah, I put up refocused tasks, merge on packaging best practices, and then some stuff. So, um, one thing which came up is that the task packages are really great for once. I mean, that's certainly true, but. If you look, for example, at the, um, I think it was like the imaging task, which has like 70 packages. And for example, other tasks have loads of tech packages. And one thing we could think about is maybe how to make it easier for people to install it. So on the one hand, have the task packages, which are a super great overview of what you can have in Debian. But if they say, okay, I want to do I want to do scientific publishing, and then um, I'm not sure it makes sense to bomb them with 100 packages with every tech-related package, basically, we have, or like 17 different ways of making diagrams and plotting. Um, it's difficult. So I'm, I don't really have a good answer, but I feel that converging on a couple of really good ones and how do we figure that out ones um, would be good. So if somebody has some ideas on that, or is there, are, is everybody happy? Yeah, you can take, sure, take the microphone. So maybe that will be, oh, yeah, right. Um, you can also sit here, if, well, I don't know, it might block good. a bit the. Uh, I'll just sit here. Okay. Um, so uh, tasks files, they provide us with pretty much highest level after the blend of what we are dealing with. Right, so they're really coarse, and they're not orthogonal. As I mentioned, that we have packages yeah. present in multiple of them, which creates a hassle how to maintain them in all those tasks across different even blends. So that's it's solution which works so far, but it's not the ideal solution. What do you mean by a blend? Uh, let's say Debian Science and Debian Met. That's two different blends, and they have separate tasks files. So this is blends. So what blends, so it used to be Debian, custom Debian distribution, but that was very confusing because it's really Debian. So now we call it blends. It's basically a set of packages in Debian which belongs to something, so. And that is, how is that different than, the, than a task? Well, the, mm. each blend has multiple tasks. There is a page which lists, let's say in science, it's not just science, right? right? It has different fields of science. Uh -huh. And actually Debian Matt could be considered also a field of science. That's why there is this great, of, uh, great deal of overlap. Word? But What's what this we are lacking seems to be is ontology of all those packages and finer kind of characterization of the packages in terms of what field do they belong to and uh, what they work with. We have tags, right? They signal some information about what formats it works with, but the list is restricted. We can, it's not easy to uh, expand it. But let's say the easiest start could be to provide tags for every blend and task, right? Yeah. So for every package, we just put it in respective, we tag it with the respective blends and tasks as next level and maybe sub-sub-level. 
let's say, in imaging, as you pointed out, there is too many packages. And some packages work with, let's say, just anatomical images, anatomical scans. Some packages, they work with functional data, do functional analysis, and that could be tagged as ne next sub-level of that. We just don't have that infrastructure at the point. That's Andreas Tillo, by the way. Andreas. Who, who does these tasks? Uh, Andreas, uh, are you suggesting that we just use deb tags? Is that the, or, or I'm not sure what you're trying to get at. Andreas says deb tags, question mark, question yeah. mark, question mark. That's difficult. So, so I'm trying to elicit some. It's late at night there, I know. <laughs> I, I'm curious how. I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm just being... But just one uh, second, so the difference between blends and tasks is clear? So, for example, that's Debian Matte Blend, and it has, like, 20 tasks for different things, right? So it's medicine, but then you have medical data, dental, epidemiology. And by the way, it has a typesetting task as well. And um, probably imaging task, yeah. Yeah, I think we've got some duplicate packages <laughs> in Debian Science and Debian Matte here. Okay, so please go on. I'm Confused? not sure I even want to ask because I'm just not sure I actually understand the utility of this at all, but maybe, the, the, maybe I shouldn't go down that route. The purpose is that we have more than five packages in Debian, and if you want to know what packages are there for you for a specific purpose, yeah, you, but, have, you can look at dev tags, and then you right. can find packages that work with images. Right. But for many, you know, if you go deeper into specialization, you quickly end up you know, having either thousands of packages or none, depending on what you looked for. And the, the task files are the source of you know, you know, looking at what package is listed in what task file, and the task belongs to some, uh, represents yeah. something specific to you know, you, what you can do with it. I think I understand, but, but I just, you know, and, and I, usually want to, I usually sort of know what I want to do. And maybe want or would like a list of things that do the things that I'm interested in. But I, I would never, I, I actually don't like tasks at all because I never want to install everything that does one thing. And it's hard for me to imagine that anybody really wants that. Right, but, but in addition, they, the task files are used to generate the meta packages, but they are just one effect of the task files. For, for us, for a NeuroDevin website, the, they are the primary source of meta information. And we don't, we don't look at the meta packages. We just fetch the stuff from, from SVN, and we have the most up-to-date thing, right? Yeah, but then the my response would be the same question, why not dev tags? You just tag packages based because, on whatever because, their utility is. Because if you, you can, we can, right now we can tag all our packages with, uh, what is it, tag needed or something? Because, and, and there is lots of discussion about, okay, when is the threshold reached to add another tag, right? And there is consensus that we shouldn't have a tag for anything you know, really, really specific. But that's pretty much precisely what we want for, for science, because it is really, really specific. So we have with the task files now a solution that we know doesn't scale, right? One of the task files has 70 packages, so, so the solution could be we split the task, right? Another package com comes, and now it doesn't fit only in one task, it fits in two. So we need to duplicate that over and over. And the solution would be a tagging-like thing. But the way that Dev tags is, you know, it's, it's what, what it's trying to achieve now, at least in my uh, perception, is not doing the job. Although technically, it's pretty much ideal. Well, why, why can't we just make it do the job that we want? I mean, it, it's just tagging, right? You could have an infinite number of tags on a package. No, then that's somebody the point. maintains them. You can them. ask for an infinite number of packages, but they won't happen automatically. It's not wiki like. You can tag any package with any tag that there is, but you cannot. You can't, you can't easily generate yourself. new tags. You can suggest why is that? that? Does anybody know why that is? Well, there, is, there was a comment on IC. For example, they do not create new dev tag if there are not more than some number, seven, I think, of packages in the archive. So you want to have like, okay, it doesn't make sense to have tags for, for something which is only two packages. So not, not to have too much tags and stuff like that. But sometimes why there not? is just two things in the world that do something. What's wrong with having a, a packet, only one package with a, t a, a tag yeah. that is only on one package? I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think one other point is that through these tasks, in, as they are in subversion, we also use some more metadata, uh, metadata on it. For example, right now, I believe all these um, references and biography, 
they are actually maintained in the task subversion. And so it's not just a list of packages, but also some related metadata. And probably I think it's a good idea to move that metadata into the package if possible. On the other hand, you really have to acknowledge that doing it this way really makes things easier. So, I mean, it was really awesome what people showed on these task packages. You have all that kind of stuff, like bibliography, references, and so on. So you can like easily create new stuff like Andreas is doing and, and make, make it great, but then we should think about um, once it has settled to, to move the metadata back into the package or the packages list file. Moreover, uh, those tasks files are crucial, I think, for visibility of packages which are on the way to Debian. So whoever, let's say, wants to package and there is ITP bug filed, it's listed there also if it was added to task files already with the reference, already with tentative location of the perspective packages, right? So all the information is there like it is already in the Debian, which is quite important. And as Michael pointed out, why it's not there yet and maybe why it cannot get there at all. So it, it's more than just kind of duplication of information, but it's indeed easy way to add information about upcoming packages. You have Adam has a just, okay. uh, Thanks. Note on dead tags, I think the you know, reason that uh, you know, for, for restricting them and for, for requiring that a large number of packages to use them is they're basically a, a, an aid for, for searching and uh, you know, searching large numbers of packages. And so if you create large numbers of tags, then you just recreate the same problem. So, you, so the idea is to try and uh, you know, capture user interests in as few as possible tags and, and, uh, and capture as many packages in as many ways as possible. Uh, I apologize if there is some gap in my uh, knowledge, but so how, how do actually dev tags come into packages? So initially there was a campaign where they wanted us to go to the website and do it. Yeah. I started doing it for some packages and then it became, and the web interface was suboptimal because I had to like really do it manually. If it were, for example, something like I can add it to a control file below my binary packages, then I would be more encouraged to do it. But so I stopped, and maybe someone else tagged my package or some, I don't know, something happened. One, so if the dev tags is going to be something which you don't control, and someone else can add tags or can disagree with tags, as long as that is what is going to happen, you can't depend on it to you know, group mm. your packages the way you want to, right? Shouldn't you, as the maintainer or group of maintainers, control the tags and then I achieve believe it? Through the control file these days, you can add Tags, oh, maybe I cannot add new tags. Can you do that? I'm I not don't sure. know. I'm, I'm not, not really I sure about it. I don't think so. Maybe. You cannot. Okay, then sorry. I'm not really a high user of dev tags. I have to admit. Yeah, I mean that's one thing. Dev tags has been is it's still, important, but I really it's still not something which is like codified in one of those. You were pointing to those many documents, developer reference, whatever. So it's still not there. Which as you make it there, it might creep into more packages and become more useful, right? Mm. Uh, is someone here using the tags? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there is your answer. Yeah. Well, I, 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 at some point, I tried to win. Yeah, go, me too. I tried. all the packages, but it, since it's detached from the actual packaging and maintenance process, it's. it's yeah, I don't see I the point. I tried to forget. I, I like blends because you can see the result immediately, but with yeah. tags, you can't. Well, we. Right. Thanks. Did somebody have Moreover, uh, tagging, if it was done in control pack. Uh, in control file. The control file is natively providing you a hierarchy. First you spe specialize source, right? You give the tags for what is the domain of the task, but then you give for dev, you give library, development, right? So you can specialize right there and it's native. With, I believe, dev tag in cloud, it's, you need to go binary by binary. Yeah, binary by binary. So it, it just doesn't scale. It's painful. Okay, so maybe we should See, David, please take a Oh, I don't think it's just us. I mean, I, I think that it sounds like dev tags is has issues that that should be discussed and conceivably fixed, but As maybe nobody in a larger a specialist, context. Yeah, maybe it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and maybe you know we should try and have a dev tags. Is there anybody? at DevConf, who is a big dev tags advocate? Uh, right, Enrico is not here, so I'm not sure. Yeah, you can see it here. So Andrea says we should go to the task pages, and there we can go 
there is a page, there's a button on the task pages, which, well, like lens pages, which says go depth tagging, and then you can, you can modify the tags. So basically, through the task page, there is a low barrier of entry of doing that, just as an informational point if you want to know how to do it. But yeah, I don't think there is a big depth tags person around, so. I mean, I would like to, to move a bit on. It's already half, mm -hmm. like 20 minutes. I mean, something I would really like to discuss, and I'm not sure, I mean, if nobody really likes it, then um, we can just drop it. But So we have the social contract, which says Debian will always be free and stuff. But why don't we have like a contract to academic upstream people saying like, um, we will make sure that it is very easy for people to register on your site or something like that because what the task packages right now do is you get, just go there and you click and you can register. I mean, so that's really helpful for a lot of upstream um, academic people because that way they can show their uh, funding agencies that actually their software is getting used and they get a lot of money out of it. So a lot of times, I've seen it in the last couple of weeks, I've seen that several like programs or codes in my field, um, they were behind a registration form, right? So you had to put in your name, your address, email, affiliation, and you said submit, and then you would get an email with a password and then you can FTP download, and then actually it's GPL. So I'm not sure whether they know that I could just redistribute it if they put it under the GPL, but I think it's this whole mindset of having to register is basically because they are afraid that as soon as they put it on the internet, um, they don't have, well, they don't have control, but also they, they will not really know how many people use it. So if we have something like, we will ensure that users see this uh, thing to register, or um, we ensure that um, people see in the copyright or wherever we make it up the, the citation um, to be used and things like that. Maybe that would, as a, as a, not just as a feature, but as a commitment, that would make it much easier for upstream people to adopt it. I mean, I haven't really thought it through what, what we could put in there, but it might be a good selling point for upstream people to relicense their stuff on their DFSG free license and getting it stuff into Debian if they see the academic value out of it, not just the free software value out of it. I'm not sure what people are thinking about that. Um, Adam, let's, let's start with Adam and then okay. you, see you next. It's a very good point. And the first, first thought that comes to my mind uh, is, is to use DebConf, though I, I know people complain about DebConf abuse and lots and lots of DebConf things, but uh, it seems like a logical thing when someone installs a package that that would be when they would register uh, the site. Uh, I see a problem with uh, a single machine used by like multiple users, but with the same account, like stuff like that. Like for example, say you're, in, you're teaching a class or something, and they are using a software like do you want to make all the students like sign some agreement uh, like saying that okay they will do this like it just becomes like impractical at some point I don't know That's well maybe you could have um, can I just say that, that yeah. I, I'm totally opposed to that idea it's well, totally it non-free right it should always no, be no 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 I'm not talking about why, why should it be non-free well, I, what is I'm not talking about click-through licenses or anything. I know, but I voluntary. hate that stuff. Like Condor makes you, like, you know, well, Condor has their own licensing issues. But, right. you know, they make you go through something like that where you have to put in your name and register in order to get access to the source code. Yeah, we're, we're and I would hate, I would never want to make the users well, of something. Okay, we're, we're talking about something voluntary that. here, not something that you have to do. Uh, and if, if it were required, it would be non-free, right? So, so that's Yeah, right. Um, what my point is that but I'm they are doing it because that's their only way they can guarantee that they get this data or whatever. And I would say that if we say that in the copyright file or through whatever we decide, we make the user aware that they should register for the, like the sake or the profit of that project, um, we, so then they can think, okay, is that enough for me to have it as a free license or not? It doesn't mean that the, we would enforce this in any way on our users. Yeah, I guess I'm just dubious of that need, really. I mean, I, I don't know yeah, that's, if, that's, I, I think that I'm a lot wondering. of people in academia think they need stuff that they don't need. But, I mean, but, I don't know, I don't know what, you know, I don't know why Condor insists on making you go through, jump through these hoops to get their source code, but 
I can't imagine it's a really legitimate reason, really. So, so James, I, I understand your perspective, but you're not applying for a lot of grants, are you? That's true. That's true. <laughs> so, so I think we have to recognize that, that, that it's a painful part of academic life to, to get money to support students. Um, and, but oh, I would, but uh, that was, uh, I just wanted to interject. I wonder if we can leverage PopCon. I mean, it's a... Uh, yeah, I was thinking that. I, it would be a, at least a first step, right? We can say... But that, yeah, but that, that's also voluntary. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. But, but it's, uh, it's, but it's, lever it's leveraging existing infrastructure, right? Well, yeah. so sure. If, if we, no, no, why? why? So the, if you go to one of those projects, right, where they want you to register, that's also voluntary. Nobody checks these things. You, you can put in, uh, I, I don't like you, and I come from no, nowhere, and just click download, and you'll get it, right? It's voluntary, it's just a hassle. The problem is that if we, what, what we should aim for is the best upstream relationship that we should have, right? It's very easy for us to just register once and say, uh, hello, Rabbit, and get the software, then put it to Debian, and let's assume that Debian is the thing that everybody uses, we pretty much you know, take away any popularity statistics that they can do, right? So that's a good start for a packaging project, right? They will love you because you, you don't play the game the way they want you to do. Of course the license permits you to do so, but w what, what do you gain, right? They are the guys that develop the stuff, they are the only ones, presumably, right? Now you take them away their, their monetary resources. What will happen? It will die. Yeah. And then you can flag it upstream that and remove it from Debian. Boom. <laughs> no, but see, that's the sort of thing that, I, I mean, I agree with you, David, that I'm not applying for funding and that there are funding agencies that make these absurd sort of restrictions, but they're absurd restrictions. And I'm not saying we should go around to all of the upstream maintainers and say, you know, you need to get rid of this stuff because it's absurd. But, you know, most of, you know, there, in no, no, other than in software, there's not doing some sort of like survey of how popular your science is. It's right? a citation index. I mean, it is. It's what determines my salary, basically. I mean, <laughs> how many people cite that, my papers? Yeah. But that's, that is, I don't think that is the same thing as how many people have installed the yeah, package. It's software. No, it's, but it's a, the, it's, it's a related thing. The of it right? is, it's not, a is thing. not related to the number of people that have installed a package. And so, and so I also think we could just as say that we expose the, the citation uh, details to our users, not as we, that we force it on them, but we say, okay, if the user installs this package, they know exactly where the proper citation is. And, and things like that. So that might make it more popular for upstream people to work with Debian because they know if somebody installs their, their stuff, they, okay, first of all, let's say they get through PopCon uh, pretty good, um, uh, well, they don't get exactly where, what the people are and stuff, but okay, that's debatable, you don't need that. And then they also, the users know how to cite it properly without having to wait through readmes or upstream stuff. And so if we put everything uh, on that, uh, on a, in a central location where it's easy to find. Yeah, maybe I'm saying the same thing as that? you are. Um, I, I think... Did it just crash? It, it's... Sorry. I'm th I think it's important that we provide facilities for academics to get their grants. <laughs> but between PopCon and this bibliography thing, we were talking about may, maybe maybe that's good enough, or maybe there's some other third thing we can do. But I, I'd agree with what, what's your name, Jamie. Jamie? That you know, adding another voluntary thing that only 14 percent of the people are going to use. You know, what it it also seems pointless, um, as well as pointless. You know, you know I, how much. How, how many grants can you get from such vacuous statistics? But if we can give them something real, so is there anything besides PopCon and um, bibliography um, support that we can do for packages to support academics and their grants and, and, and so on? It, 
is it really relevant? Uh, I am not sure you have to do such thing to get grants. I'm applying daily on grants well, and I don't need that. David, I agree with you, Graham. So, so it, it's true, although, although I, I championed that notion that I personally, I personally don't get credit for writing software. I get credit for writing papers using the software that I write. So I don't. I mean, uh, so I think I, I'm not the right person to answer that. Well, well, can I say? I mean, for example, Condor. You cited Condor, right? They are GPL in principle, but to get the source, you have to register. No, they they, they are GPL since a couple of years or something. Uh, even if artistic, they are not artistic, artistic license. Yeah. Well, but anyway, what I wanted to say is that uh, what you can do if the, if you increase the visibility of the software, like something like NeuroDebian is doing. This is on top of the popcorn statistics. And so they, at some point, would be, for them, useful to be able to say, well, we are supported by Debian. So it, but at the moment, it's just not a selling point. You cannot tell it to anyone. But as soon as then you know, it becomes an honor to be there, then you could use this argument in a grant. But uh, it's not true that the no scientists are not getting uh, um, credit for the software because it depends. I mean, if you are writing software as a side effect of your research is one thing, but there are projects that work. I mean, they are software based. I mean, they, they get grants to write software, like Condor is one example. But and okay. uh, SciLab sci sci is another example. I, I, I agree with you. So uh, I didn't want to, don't want to be misconstrued as saying other people aren't in that situation. I just that because of my situation, I'm not the right person to, to say, yes, I need this data for grant applications, because I don't. So I think it's much less of an initial grant application. It's if, you, if you get funded with a couple of million to produce something, then you have to, at, at the end, somehow justify what did you do with money. And, and part of it is to say that it's actually useful, and as in it's actually used. But I don't think it's Devin's purpose, or it's Devin's responsibility to feed them with data, right? But we should make the impression that we are able to play the game properly. So we should, we should make it easy for people that use the stuff to reference it. And if they, if they want to provide that information, maybe to register on their mailing list, Upstream has all kinds of ideas what they want to do with the data. Then they should find that information because they won't necessarily see Upstream's homepage. That's what we are taking away by, by distributing the stuff ourselves. And if we, we just need to be a nice player in, in that scientific game. And we don't have to enforce data collection of any sort. How, how, how about uh, what can we tell them? Your software is now distributed on what? 14 architectures, um, here's packages.debian.org slash package name and look up the Google page rank for it, and the plus PopCon, plus uh, bibliography references. Now you're starting to make an uh, advocacy case. Uh, so I, I think we'd be better off saying we promise to make sure the user sees the URL of your homepage than any of those factors that you mentioned. And, mm -hmm. and if we can somehow even make sure we have links. I mean, we do, right? We, we have all these things. And, and if the issue is the users don't see the, the home page, then, then we should think about, I don't know, do we want to somehow make an effort that the users can see the, the home page? I, I, you, could, you could just encourage the upstream to have like a banner when you start, start the software. That would be that splash screen, yeah, something like that. But let me just say that um, I think that the thing that I was responding to sort of viscerally is the, you know, I'm a, I'm a big advocate, I'm a big free software person, and I don't like it when in the academic world people make up weird licenses and weird restrictions for getting their code because of some weird notions they have about needing to get credit for it or needing um, Need, needing it because their funding agencies are weird and think that they need this information. And I guess my, my opinion is that as you know, scientists who are working in Debian and care about free software, we should try to encourage the upstream people as best we can without you know, antagonizing them that 
um, you know, using things like GPL and, and properly licensing their code with free licenses is better for them in the long run than putting in weird restrictive stuff that doesn't, that probably they don't even realize is not going to be so, useful. So nobody, I think, is suggesting that we encourage the use of non-DFS blah, 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 G licenses, but um, the issue is there are things that Upstream would like which are not required by the license, and we're saying, should we support those things? In fact, it sounds like we have the same goal, that, uh, that basically what we're trying to do is to, is to say, uh, if you use these free licenses, uh, you know, we will help you in this, in this way. Uh, so encourage people to use the free license. On a side topic, although that's kind of actually a major topic, um, do we have any flow back to upstream to, inf to just give them kudos? We have report bug kudos, which goes, I believe, to package maintainer, right? We have, no, we have good infrastructure to propagate the bugs, right? We know how to f mark them forwarded. We don't have any infrastructure to... Uh, no standard way to do anything. Oh, well, there is no, there were no Linux at some point. But, um, so maybe it's worth thinking about more global kind of maybe approach, how do we report back to upstream about the success of their software. Just maybe gratitudes, right? This is what it is, pretty much. Popcon is just plain statistics, which somewhat works, but not quite so even in respect to those. But there are many satisfied people, and we, they install system, they might like it. There is nothing which hints them that they could somehow, besides emailing, figuring out whom to email, right, and saying thank you. Right. And we were getting actually emails from users who were just saying thank you, right? But it's, it's non-trivial job for them. And maybe there could be global, not just for scientific software. On your software, I don't know if you develop software, but do you usually receive uh, good comments? Because uh, on Scilab, it's pretty unusual that people are sending us good comments, or bad comments, or comments anyway. And I don't think in Debian we have enough time to do such things. I, I like, but uh, at what point you are sending kudos to upstream and how? And if you know who upstream is and how you can get in touch with him, which is not a, always the case. And theoretically we have copyright file, right? Yeah, but uh, you know that in the scientific world, some of the package I maintain are 20 year old, so right, the guy might be dead and I don't have the email and so on. That's the it's problem, right? We don't kudos. know even how to say kudos, yeah. right? So maybe no, no, we it's have worth no idea how can to send them. Maybe it's worth in, uh, putting instructions into, not instructions, in copyright file, what is the contact address, right? There you, uh, uh, actually, we are doing the, the copyright holder, not exactly the author. And what's mean author in a free software? Sometimes it's a corporation, sometimes it's a mailing list, sometimes it's nothing. There is the maintainer field in the, in the file header. The, in the I'm always talking about machine readable copyright. Yeah, but you're There's talking about Debian maintainer? No, mm -hmm. the maintainer, the upstream maintainer. Yeah, it's usually the copyright holder. But we put inside. Well, I think that's a side issue, or is it really? I mean, it's it's a nice idea if somebody does it, but well, but that actually puts you into a framework how to create at least some flow from the users right. willingly to provide. So let's say if you provide field for mandatory registration kind of thing, right? It's not mandatory, but at least maybe you could collect. Let's say I, I'm using Debian system. Ooh, I love it. I have 20 packages which upstream bags for information, right? And they run some utility which just checks which packages actually ask for such information and it just sends them email that, oh, I'm hmm. Joe, I love Debian, I run your software, these on these. Thank you. And that's Please, yeah. Can I move to a different topic we've listed? Uh, yes. I, my question is, uh, I mean, you've written supporting non-free compilers um, uh, like ICC or AFC, I think that's very specific. I think. Um, yeah, maybe I'll make it more general. No, no. Uh, let me tell you. Even. I've been in a university for in two countries now for seven, eight years now. That you do. Do you know which the distribution of choice for them for Linux is? It's CentOS. 
for the simple reason that most proprietary software which proprietary software vendors give is support is usually only for Red Hat and Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So everyone wants CentOS. So I have lots of friends who are like who like who use Debian a lot, but because they don't want to muck around with the scripts and you know change things, the proprietary software is what makes them install CentOS, which is one thing. So I wonder what we can do to, I mean, of course we don't want to encourage proprietary users or something, but if you want to increase your user base in general, what, is it, what should we do to facilitate people who want to use proprietary software to use Debian? What can, how can we drive Debian there in, I mean, what can we do for that? I think that's what the LSB, the Linux standard base is, uh, is partly for. Uh, uh, I, if except it is, I don't think much proprietary software uses it. Yeah, no, on, even if it is, field. Even if it is, lots of proprietary software do work on Debian, but the vendors will never ever say anything other than Red Hat. And the only thing which is equal to Red Hat in every way except for the trademark things is CentOS. So system administrators who don't know much, they don't want to, you know, say, say no, no, Debian might not work, only Red Hat works, so I'll use CentOS. So that's what they say. So well, Okay, I guess, I guess that I should say that was the goal of, of the LSB. Um, and you know, Debian had some input and different things, but uh, so that so that most software that runs on Red Hat should also run on Debian True. if it has. And Alien is a part of that. And uh, uh, so, but uh, I, I I don't know if that <coughs> helps. Or are, are there other things that you can think of that we can do in Debian? I don't know. I mean, how can we just, uh, encourage people to do it? Is what my what my question is. Encourage how or what? No, I mean, the first thing, if you ask any system administrator, what is your choice? You want to run, for example, in electronics, there's a software called Cadence. I need Cadence. The people who write Cadence say, run it on Red Hat, so I will use only Red Hat or CentOS. Okay, but I mean, Isn't, that's stupid. Is, is it an awareness? Yeah, it might be an awareness gap. So most system administrators are not like you and me. So they have been trained in certain ways, and they don't think out of the box, and they're not like the skilled system administrators which we think we are. They're, Proprietary software vendor says this, I will use this, I will not try anything else. And therefore, students like me are forced to, you know, use CentOS even though, you know, I could try to well, talk the administrator into trying well, something else. It's, it's, a, it's a decision they take. Uh, it's CentOS a decision they software. take. But maybe, you, I mean, maybe I think we should, like, tell the proprietary yeah, software vendor. I don't think it's a different uh, question to why are so many users are using Ubuntu and not Debian. I mean, something, sure, True. we, we Not, make Debian better or make it oh, more Oh, no, no, now you're like, right. Since Ubuntu has come, since they say it works on Ubuntu, yes, that's true. But maybe I was just saying we should get, like, get Debian's name listed on these proprietary software vendors' supported lists. Yeah. So, so I mean, I, I, I can actively, I can also try to, you know, contact the vendors of software whom I I think I the first step would be to actually make it run on Debian. I'm sorry? The first step would be to make sure that it runs on Debian. And yeah, no, then you can list it. It does. Yeah. If it does, I should, I mean, maybe users should oh, yeah. tell them. Okay, well, so you may. I, or, uh, did you want to go, David? Maybe just a, a short comment that, I mean, outside of universities, there's absolutely nothing you can do if it's not on the box. I mean, no manager is going to sign off on CentOS. I agree. The, so, it is only because I have the, some hope that I'm trying to. Okay. <laughs> So just to be clear. If, if you're using commercial software that requires Red Hat, then you have to use Red Hat. For everyone else, it's just advocacy. They might, you know, maybe they've gotten into the habit of CentOS or, or not, but, you know, you can advocate and that's good, but what, what can we do? Not much uh, other than advocacy. Well, I want the proprietary, I mean, maybe we should market Debian, the name Debian, to the proprietary software vendors as well. Yeah, but you can do that. I mean, works. I mean, I should do that. Yeah, I you, understand. Do, you yeah. should do that. Yeah, advocacy. It's, it doesn't need um, any technical exactly, changes, yes. right? So. I, I, I wanted to, um, Sylvester's Atlas question, I was hoping we'd have a moment for it. Right. And, and I, but I wanted to make a comment. I think this kudos idea is awesome. I want to talk about that more. But let moderator uh, decide where should we go no let's I think we should go to that um, easy recompilation of things so <laughs> what what we had in what we had in, in Debian for a while is module assistant I'm not sure whether it's still used DKMS is used these days to recompile kernel modules 
And I think some kind of like that infrastructure wouldn't be so bad for, for scientific software. <laughs> um, because I have the feeling that at least quite a lot of admins um, recompile quite a lot of the stuff, even though it might be in Debian, because they think it's just better if they do it like the gentle way, you know, like it's more optimized. So maybe, and of course, it's easy to just app get source, app get build dep, app depackage, build package, and stuff like that, and then put it in a repository. But actually having it, so the nice thing about Module Assistant is that it makes sure that everything, it's, it's menu driven, and it makes sure that everything is easily done, so you can install it, and, and it, it's not really much, much of a problem, and no error to entry. So Adam first, and then Luca. I agree, and there, uh, and we, we've talked about Atlas as an example. Another one is FFTW uh, that yeah. uh, that can achieve a lot of optimization by tuning for cache and memory sizes and number of uh, cores, etc. cetera. Um, the uh, compilation time is definitely an issue, and if there's some way to background it, the way that, for example, some uh, uh, some post ins tasks are backgrounded, uh, I think, where the, some of the old tech packages uh, did that. But the difficulty then is that when, you, when the package is installed, you want to be able to run it. So maybe for that, you could have the ref laws in there and, and then but have LD just, config switch to Atlas uh, when so it's So do you think compiled. it should be, well, if you recompile it on post that basically gets it out of the package management system? Or but my idea would be to, to recompile to a new binary package, which would then get automatically installed. Right, you're spoiled. Well, yeah, we're spoiled. Well, okay, sorry, Luca first. Yeah, so there's up to get source dash dash compile. That's as simple as that. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure we need more infrastructure than that to recompile packages. No, I would disagree with that. If I can. So I, the, the problem with that is that you then have to manage the, the source and, the, and mm. the installing of the package. No, right? apparently it does it. Does it install it, Luca? What, what well, about what about just an apt git install dash dash compile package name? Well, right? my, my so it's point that's managed one, in the background. One important point about um, Debian uh, modular system in DKMS is that you get a list of the supported to be recompiled well drivers in this case. But so it would be nice in that way that um, admins see a list of like okay these packages support and to be figured out in a way being recompiled easily and then you just click on them and then they get recompiled so they it's like a, a not a so they don't have to figure out what they actually want to recompile but it's the way to do that seems to me to have that as inside of apt right so that it's yeah but then you have like 1000 packages you don't want to recompile vi no, 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 for example no, no, no. you don't want to but just saying if you want to recompile a package yeah. you just give it a, an, an install option that that does it and puts the 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 dot deb, you know, it downloads the source into a, a very well specified place. It compiles it there, yeah, generates yeah, the, a deb, yeah, installs that into into app the way that devs usually are, and then installs it into your system. Sounds difficult. Oh, why? You have to get a built environment, everything like that. Well, you have up. to do that anyway, though. Right. But if you, but if the packager if the packager is doing this and saying, okay, I know how to compile this. I'm gonna I'm gonna set up the package such that it can be easily compiled on your system and then it just does it in a known location, that's way easier for the user than to have to, to, have to manage the source code on themselves. Yeah, I don't think we want them to manage the source code. Right, and that's the problem with app get source, is that you do have to manage it yourself. Some people on IRC say, say that apt minus build might do it. Yeah, but oh. they also say it's orphaned and unmaintained. <laughs> yeah, Jerome. Uh, Jerome. <clears throat> yeah, I uh, just wanted to mention, at some point I put together a package called debconf-src, which is on my website, and the principle would, um, <laughs> the source package would be configured, there would be an equivalent to dpkg build package but uh, which would have debconf templates, both from the system for configuring standard variables like CC or deb build ups or so on. And you could include also templates in the source package itself and shell snippets for the configuration script. Mm -hmm. And the idea was uh, complex packages like you would like to build a cross-compiler or something, 
you could configure the source package um, easily. And I kind of like the idea that Jamie had to integrate this into APT at some point. And but you know, so integrating into APT takes time, and yeah. it's not, not very easy. So, so but that's an interesting. Yeah, thing. but that would have made my next step. So um, I just want to mention if someone wants to work on this, or mm -hmm. I'm interested they anyway. should contact me. I remember that Humail used to do that also for licensing issues. But the problem with Atlas, it is the main problem and what is bothering me. What I like with Debian is when you install a package, it takes two seconds to download it and one second to install it. With Atlas, I would have to wait 30 minutes to one hour and a half, and I found that very boring on this side. I know that I don't have any other choice, but uh, I found that very, very boring. I, but like, I like the idea to install, uh, I think Adam said that before, but I like the idea to install LAPAC and BLAST and using them while you are compiling the software behind and get the kind of feedback when it's compiled and installed on your computer. But I think it is going to be pretty hard to implement. Well, yeah, you can use the base LAPAC until the compilation is finished. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as um, for the discussion about apt build and the like, there is also an apt SRC package that, script that supports um, has options to uh, build and uh, then uh, install the um, the the, the uh, dev package if, 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 if desired. So you can actually do that just with one command. And as far as I know, it's still maintained. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. oh yeah. Uh, I'll check the mic. This is kind of tangential to the same point, um, but related to the Atlas package. Uh, like the problem that you had was uh, like the machine that you compile might not be the same as the machine that the user might compile, right? I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm too naive, but uh, one idea I have is. Say you comp like whenever Atlas compiles, it probably generates something like a specification .txt file, like which says okay what kind of like threads it decides to use and stuff like that. Yeah, it does. Uh, so maybe like uh, when you are trying when the user tries to install, so you you compile the package and you have a specification .txt file in your machine, and you supply that, and when when the user tries to install it. And you try to generate the same specification.txt file using like a post rm script or something, and see if those two match. Otherwise, you compile it then, yeah, or good, give the user. The, regard if you have a look on the number of computers on the market, the probability that the match is very low. Yeah. The problem, it is so many yeah. Then then you just give a warning to the user, like like a menu yeah, screen. But in I think. Uh, in 95% of the cases, you will have this warning, so I'm not sure it is worth the trouble. Sure, but at least the system administrator will know that he is running a suboptimal package yeah. mm -hmm. uh, actively. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, does Atlas notify that, that when, I don't even sure, I guess it would be in a news file or something like that, that the, what you're running has been compiled very suboptimally for your system? Uh, um, in fact, if for now you've got something like six or seven op already optimized packages. So if you are using base, you know that it will be under optimized and you can guess with the name of the packages that the one you are installing is not good or good uh, regarding to your computer. But for now, what I, tried, what I tried to do when I was, when I adopt this package was to match a previous behavior and it is why, it is why I real, when I realized that it was crappy. But uh, yeah. Mm. I haven't used the Debian news to say that the package is not usable and suboptimal, but maybe I should do that. I, I wouldn't have been aware of that otherwise. Yeah. I, I, I had a thought, but I think you just convinced me it's no good, so I'll say it anyway. Maybe it works for things other than Atlas. I mean, there are, there are build farms, right, that, that are more or less publicly accessible, and if it was a question of Okay, look, there's a hundred different configurations, which is you know a small-ish number, and but we don't know which ones people are going to use, and so if people could choose, I want configuration 17, and we look and we say, oh great, it's cached, zip, it's installed, 
and at least the next person who does that uh, doesn't have to suffer through that. What is your number? Oh, 17, right? <laughs> Uh, just stupid idea. Um, maybe it should be a cron job. So there is a pool of packages which need to be built and installed, and you don't want the user to mess with them. So whenever you install it, yeah, this will I mean, tell it that it will be somewhere in the background. Probably do you want it now or later, and just forget about it, and then it just gets. Would you like your computer to run uh, without any warning and building a stuff which can take a few hours on your computer by night? If you, are, if you are using, for example, a cluster for HPC computing, you don't want your computer to build, to rebuild the package at midnight and while you are doing a huge computation. Uh, well, for those, you build it once, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Per each architecture within your cluster. I will, of course, I don't want to run it on all the nodes and waste half a days for them just to build. I just pre-build it once and deploy it across the cluster. Yeah, you could do that, especially since usually in cluster you've got the same computer everywhere. But yeah, the, the problem with the cron it is you you have to know that it is will be it will be built that way, which is not yeah, very yeah. obvious. And I have no way to tell to the user, to the normal user, that it is going to be built this way. What I'm worried about is how the user will understand that his package is going to be built. If the user understands that he needs Atlas. You're That's right. already kind of yeah, what next I level. Do well, I don't know. I mean, Atlas is a runtime dependency for quite a lot of stuff. It's not necessarily that you think, oh, I need Atlas. Uh, you, oh, I, I want to do that kind of calculation. And then yeah, but what, Atlas. what I would and like is uh, every user to run Atlas and get the best performance he can. Sure. I would like to improve the, the usage of Atlas in Debian regard yeah, but against they might, Blast. I'm just saying they might just think that the application sucks because it's so slow. They might not realize that it's, the problem is that Atlas right. is generically they will compiled think that. or something. Yeah, they would think that. Well, so I think we're running out of time. I mean, we can still stick around, but I think the video team should be relieved. Six. So, one thing, well, let's just say one closing thing. So, one thing I was thinking about, but I'm not sure whether there's any support for that, is the other thing. Um, I believe that, I'm, well, I'm not quite sure because uh, I can ask Andreas. Um, are there any non free packages in the task files? Yes. <laughs> Why is the network down? Even outside of non free. Okay. So, one thing I thought about is that, um, well, I don't like non-free, but there is a couple of there is a couple of software codes where um, where the authors basically <laughs> said it's 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 basically like a BSD or GPL license, but it's only free for academic use. That's definitely non-free. Yeah, that's definitely non-free, but. I will, so my idea was to say, okay, if we do have some non-free software in a task list, then at least uh, it should be free for academic use. So in the sense that if people are using anything from the task, they can, for academic use, they can use it. And okay, there should be certainly some disclaimers to that, but I mean, I'm not sure whether it makes a lot of sense to a lot of people, but... Um, it's, some of that stuff is, is That's quite... That's the kind of stuff that I was saying we need to get rid of. Those licenses are crap. I mean, who, does that, who does that serve? It doesn't serve them. It certainly doesn't serve anybody that wants to use that package. Well, there is certainly... I mean, I was just talking that there are people are using proprietary software, right? So, and that's, that is proprietary software. And, and it, I mean, as a sense that you have to... There's two things, right? So there's we are packaging free software, and then we are supporting our users. And they might, the only thing they might, the only possible way they can do that might be through a currently only free for academic use program. I mean, so, so it seems not, like if, 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 if the upstream is. Um, can you take the mic, please? The there's one here. Okay, we can we can do that. Okay, like two more minutes or so, and then we will just. Do. It seems to me if you're gonna, um, I mean, if the upstream is nice enough such that you can get the code and put it into Debian, why why they 
they should maybe be somewhat receptible to pushing back on the kind of licensing stuff. Well, sure. I mean, we were all free software equity because we would try that. But I mean, the copyright could be from a university, which who don't. Who, but I, I mean, how is that even? How is that even inf possibly enforceable? If how what? is that license? I'm. Is that, is, that, is, is that something we can actually distribute in Debian? Yeah, sure, it's not free. We can distribute it not free. But how, but it's, but it's how, how is that enforced mm -hmm. then? Yeah, every, look, non-free means Debian can distribute it freely, but it might not mean that everybody can use it freely. Yeah, but that's a, that's a, that's a particularly restrictive version of non-free. Because you can't even say, I mean, who's to say what's an academic environment? I mean, how, how I don't know. That seems tough. Okay, that, to that's me. a that's a. I mean, who's? I, that's a good question, but that's but besides the point. It's a question for the lawyers. Right. The so my point is that if you think if you think you're an academic user, then this stuff is free software, except it's only free for academic use. As well to be discussed, but I mean, it's it's certainly better than non-free itself, which is basically can be as proprietary as you want, no source code, no modifications possible, nothing at all. And also not for academic use, who knows, right? So it's just that well, you know, there think, is non-free. I mean, I don't think you can, I mean, you can't package Mat MATLAB and distribute it in non-free. No, because you cannot distribute it. You have to right. read. So that's what I'm saying. That I'm, I'm, not sure you can, I'm not sure we can distribute something that's, wait, wait, that's wait, supposed to be Wait, free for academic, academic use, use not we, Wait, 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 we, what? We really do. <laughs> really? Yeah. Of course, we, there's lots of non-free stuff. If licenses don't redistribute, then sure. Or don't download unless you agree with this license you have. Yes, but if there are restrictions on use, you cannot use it in your airport. It goes to non-free. Okay. Well, and as I say, there is there is some non-free stuff like that in science. So, I'm not a I'm not a fan of non-free. Right? I voted to get rid of it. But I'm saying that this could be a specific way to at least make non-free more. Uh, nor, well, focus for academic stuff, for scientific stuff to say, well, okay, it's non-free, but as, if you're using it at a university or stuff, then, because, for example, right now, if you're, if you're downloading Debian regularly, you can be sure that it's free. And then we could tell universities, like, if you're downloading anything from the task pages, you can run it at the university because it's free for academic use. But I don't think we want to tell them that. I, I'm not against I also want to leave, sorry. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I'm not against somehow making, dividing non-free finer in some way with tags or however you want to do that, but I don't think Debian can say to anybody, if you're in a university, you can use this software because, or if you're in a, because that, that's liability. I don't know. That did, so that idea of, of Debian promising something about non-free wow. software makes me nervous. I'm not saying we're promising this stuff. Yeah, so I, I maybe... It's still, they should, well, they should still... Maybe Michael and, and Jamie and I should talk about this offline. I think yeah, everyone else can, is tired. Yeah, we should talk about this.